Hello and welcome to Word Birds, a birds of a feather conversation amongst people that care about words. Today on the show, we have Marcella Ross. Marcella is the head of content for Sales Hacker, a community owned by Outreach.io. We're going to talk today about how great content makes a water bottle more than just a water bottle, how building a great community can be done on the back of great writing, and how community can fuel B2B software and marketing. Let's sit back and get some insight from the flock. Hello, Marcella. Welcome to the show. Hey, Chris. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Very excited to have you here today. Um, things that I want to talk about, well, they're going to wait for a second. Let's just jump into the quick fire. Okay. Amazing content is? I would say it's easy to digest, delightful to read, and stirring enough to make somebody want to take action, whatever action that is. Read something else, and click something. Fantastic. <laughs> Concise or descriptive? Ugh. I hate to be so <laughs> consultatively, <laughs> but um, I think it depends. Like I, I tend to be wordy, <laughs> but concise gets you like to the point. Non-varnished words tell like are easy to digest. Um, but if you're trying to explain something, like teach something, sometimes like diving in deep is the best way. Fantastic company with the best brand voice is besides Sales Hacker and Outreach. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> I would say um, I always loved Trello's. They're just the way they they communicate. Like they're you're talking to a fellow colleague. Like they understand your pain and like they take you along on this journey. Like I'm right there with you. Ugh, it's so annoying. <laughs> That's how it feels. Best piece of content advice. Um, I would say, like, let me say. For B2B, it's definitely go talk to your developers. Like nobody, I think, has, you could talk to your customers, of course, like understand what their pain points are, but as far as solving that pain point, talking to your developers, there's nobody else in the company that has more excitement around a button or a, like a, some line of code than your developers and why they created it in that way to solve a specific problem. I love that. And when I'm creating content, I always have paper, <laughs> like a scrap <laughs> piece of paper to jot down notes because it's a lot of spaghetti. There's a lot of pop songs and cartoons running through my head at any given moment. So <laughs> um, I have to write down notes and take scraps of information and write it down because I know I have to capture it someplace else later in a more formal way. Love that. Fantastic. All right. So. I looked, I looked you up, uh, obviously, as I'm going to. That's part of what I do here. Um, and your history is kind of remarkable. Uh, you've done a lot of things. You've worked at some really interesting companies. But you started your career, I think, prior to your MBA, um, working at some of the biggest global CPG brands in the world, companies like Hasbro, GM, Target, Isotoner. How did large CPG, I guess, help to form your thinking on creation in general? Uh, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I'm from Detroit. So growing up in Detroit, you automatically think I'm going to work in the car industry, just like my dad did, just like all the rest of my family did. And so to me, it was like, oh, I want to be that, um, you know, brand manager for Corvette, right? Like <laughs> they sell themselves, okay. right? But, you know, going into it, I didn't know all the ins and outs of the industry. And so I started at, 18 formally with General Motors um, as a co-op and then worked my way until I became a brand analyst right for a commercial so far removed from Corvettes <laughs> but commercial trucks are not Corvettes but not, it so gave much. You, not so much not even in like a little bit but it gave me a lot of insight on okay this is how we do things we place ads in trade magazines we put up billboards why do we do that because we've always done that. You know, there wasn't like, we didn't have as much data as we have today that we have now. And so to me, it was always like this hunger of like, I wanna understand like how this really impacts, you know, that audience. How is this really motivating and influence them to make a decision? You know, and it's kind of carried 
on throughout my entire career, whether that's like working in Target and saying like, why does somebody want this water bottle versus this water bottle? How do I influence that decision? You know, whether it's luggage or water bottles or we're talking about, you know, hats, gloves. I worked at uh, air products, um, industrial gases and chemicals. Like what makes them want this molecule? <laughs> and it's always I mean, been, that's so interesting yeah. because when you think about it, like, so I... I mean, for a while, I was a Yeti person. Yeah. And then somebody said, that's not cool anymore. You need to be a Hydro Flask person. Mm-hmm. Well, who said? So I went out and got a Hydro Flask. Yes. And now <laughs> apparently, apparently it's Stanley. Yeah. I can't keep up. I don't have a Stanley water bottle, but I don't keep up. But that's exactly what you're saying is that we're creating the language, the message that takes something that is relatively I'm sorry, Yeti, I love you, unremarkable, and makes it more remarkable, more of an object of desire. Yeah, and and like imagine um, at Air Products where you're talking about something as intangible as like hydrogen or, you know, it's just like you can't even see it. How do you make that, influence someone to make that more desirable for them, you know? And it's the same like through any, any career choice I've made, you know, I've looked at the company like, okay, you're a lemonade stand. You know, you've got inputs and outputs, but there are people out there that are thirsty. So what are your inputs? What are your outputs? How do you talk to the people that are thirsty and get them to come to you versus grabbing some water or whatever alternative they can do, you know? And so no matter what career choice I've made, that's always helped to kind of boil it down. Like, you know, how do I make people more money or save them money or keep them safe? It's always Mm -hmm. kind of come down to those three areas. I mean, that's that's really transferable as you move forward because you can do that with any business it doesn't have to be a cpg product you could do that well where you are now Um, it just transfers that there are people that are thirsty for sales enablement platforms yeah and you have to let them know that there is one and then bring them to your well and there's no one more thirsty than sales reps that are trying to hit quota (laughs) Mm -hmm. and so it's like You know, it's even more interesting because now, you know, you can talk and stir that kind of emotion that really makes them take action. You know, it's like we're talking about you going home to see your family. We're talking about you going to president's club, you going to that next career move, you know. And so a lot more exciting. (laughs) You know, you could could create create content that's a little bit more, you know, provocative and moving. And, And rather than just create marketing material, uh, you manage something called the Sales Hacker, which is a community portal brought to you by your company, yes. but not your, not essentially a company website. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I mean, out- Outreach, um, Sales Hacker was acquired in 2018 by Outreach as their community. And so um, Sales Hacker existed prior to that as a B2B media company, a, like a, a a community for and by salespeople. And it still exists in that way. Now it's just, um, now we have, we're powered by outreach, so we can take some of those learnings and uh, some of the information that as an observer, as a sales execution platform, we see salespeople are struggling with. So we understand like, okay, these are the things you wanna talk about. Here's your community where you can, you know, suggest things to peers or ask peer questions or get like, um, kind of advice from experts out from outreach and it's really great because it's it's community led it's very community focused so all of our threads all of our articles are contributed by salespeople um, we have like research that are focused on revenue generating topics everything we do including the, our sales hacker podcast everything is like really how do we help elevate that salesperson and so there is some connection with outreach it's not like Here's where you're going to get pitched outreach all day. It's like, here's where you can t- talk about all the things that, you know, we know that you're sub- co- like challenged with because that's why outreach exists. But here's where you can talk about it with your, you know, your fellow sales reps and leaders. But at the end, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, it becomes a really interesting resource for you as a marketer at outreach or for product management at outreach where you've got direct connection to your community of 
both users and potential users because it's not yeah. closed to people that don't use the product. So exactly. you're hearing in community forums, you're hearing through posts and comments what the challenges are that need to be solved by specifically a company just like yours. Exactly. Yeah. And and because we're a community, you know, we we're not restricted to talk about just sales execution and software and SaaS, you know, like as a community, we can kind of branch off and talk about more topics that are like on the fringe. Um, and so, for example, you know, we did a state of the sales tech stack survey, like what's in your tech stack? What's working? What's not? What are you thinking about consolidating? And where that might not be a primary focus for like outreach, our core marketing team, like our community team can really talk about that and understand like, oh, okay, our, you're not really using, a, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, people in our community that are using sales enablement, for example, like understanding that and what, what challenges they're facing, what they're really focusing on. That's not something we would probably look at in our core marketing team, but as a community, we can, we can talk about that and kind of bring them closer to the brand. So, I mean, at, it's been with the company now for what, five years, mm -hmm. um, four and a half years. Is is it working? Would your CEO say this is a this is a great thing? I would say yes. In January we had this recharge event where we, you know, it's the um, it was a moment where we were like, Okay, you're almost end quarter or you're ending your year and you, you just wanna like get a shot in the arm. And so Manny Medina, he came on at, with an AMA and he was so excited to see all the questions that came in that were just like, not just like outreach focused, but community focused and just, I, I'm a salesperson in general, you know, like there were just real conversations happening. And I think that's what he's expecting from the community. Um, and I think he uh, really appreciated that event and some of the learnings and some of the people that were just bringing in closer to the brand. So how does this continue forward what is the evolution that you will be going through as you move forward what's next with sales hacker i think we're still going to branch out like different content formats just making sure that we're delivering content that's you know challenging the status quo helping people discover new tools and processes and things like that and we're going to branch out into we're looking at different channels and different methods we just brought in-person events back which was something that you know past few years sure. wasn't really happening um, and but we we saw like wow people are really hungry to just get back in person and just you know shake a hand and have a conversation like face to face and yeah. so that's one of the things that we're doing um, looking at other social channels for example because we understand people consume you know media in different ways and especially if you're a sales rep you might be on the go and you know you're handling a lot of things between home and going into the office on certain days so we're looking at that and then also looking at just making sure we um during that january recharge event we committed to delivering on four key topics that were you know accelerating deal um velocity and um, increasing revenue per customer things like that um, things that we know are top of mind for our our audience right now and so we're really focused on creating those topics and subtopics that bubble up to those those key marquee um those headlines there where are you getting traction with social right now? Which uh, which social channels? Always LinkedIn. LinkedIn is like the main channel. But we recognize that there are other channels that are starting to get a lot more visibility, a lot more traction there. But, you know, our key, our ICP, if you will, is on LinkedIn. You know, that's where those conversations, the influencers within sales, that's where they have the biggest platform. But, you know, Instagram, you know, reels and shorts and all those like short videos, even LinkedIn Live, which we haven't done very much of lately. Like those are things that we haven't done that I think are definitely worth exploring. On a recent episode, I was talking to an identity management company and mm -hmm. they have a TikTok account. <laughs> I was like, okay, say say more. I need to understand yes. how that how that yes. works. Like I, I haven't been to that corner of TikTok yet, I guess. Um, <laughs> but they're seeing some level of success because that's there's something for everybody on TikTok, as it turns yeah. out. Um, you can't tell from my stream. I just doom crawl all day. Um, but uh, but that's another channel that people seem to see working. I think that it's yeah. a direction that we're, we're headed in because there is a whole word talk side of TikTok that we could fit into. But it's it's just interesting. Uh, I agree. LinkedIn is where 
things seem to come together. We've never been a no. Facebook company, and I tried with Instagram, but mm, it's hard yeah. to hard to balance it's, there. Um, yeah, it's still got to be very visual, and it's yeah. that takes a lot of time. <laughs> Right. We're not yeah. we're words. We're not so much pictures. And it's, <laughs> yes. it's a challenge. Um, so that that brings us to to where you I mean, where you officially work at outreach um, beyond that community. How does how does outreach use content? What is the overall content strategy within the organization? You know, it's. Um, and this might be part that I, I might have to get. <laughs> um and Temi, our core marketing team, to take a look at too. But um, this is our core marketing team really looks at our community as a way to understand like our key personas. Like, you know, we're mm -hmm. talking to our sales rep, we're talking to um, SDRs and beyond, all the way up to CROs. But, you know, they are looking as a sales execution platform, not just as sales teams, like not just the AEs, the the people in the trenches. They have to talk to the CROs and the revenue teams, the entire go-to-market team in general. And so it's it's like community is a way to bring people into that, that pool, the gravitational pool of outreach. Like here's where you can get familiar with the brand, get a little deeper with the problems that you know outreach solve because we're talking about them every day as an AE or as an SDR or as a manager, you know, you've got that blog post that draws you in or you have that webinar or podcast episodes that draws you in we're talking about it in the community but then when you start to think about like oh well how do i solve that issue like how do i do like increase deal velocity and maybe you start googling that or we introduce you um through some of the content to outreach as that solution so it's very i think it's a very <laughs> soft handover you know it's <laughs> Yep. Definitely a customer-led handover. It's not like a direct CTA of like, hey, you know, schedule a demo <laughs> type of thing. But it's it's such great information that you provide that they have access to as a result of this community. It's most companies don't have that kind of immediate intelligence. You have to go pay for that. You have to get an analyst relationship with an analyst that actually speaks to the persona that you work with and then gather all of that it's a project and this lives within the extended four walls of your business it's fantastic how do you i mean how is all of this measured how does one know that this is working where is the impact really hit the road i think we're still working out because for us in the community team for us it's all about you know increasing that community size whether you're a customer or you you're you know not in the the ecosystem at all you're not in the outreach you know pool at all we want to increase our membership in our community size and so we really look at that as community growth and then engagement because we just don't want a lot of people like eyeballs <laughs> in the community we yep. want people talking to each other and so for us um, membership growth and engagement are top line um, and if and then, those work what happens I, well, because we also, um, you know, look to bring in other software or sponsors, you know, that means that not only are we introducing our community to new tools and processes that could help benefit them, but we're also bringing in people that can now help expose, like, here are the cracks in the processes that I need help with and find, like, outreach as a solution, for example, or recommend outreach as a solution. We have a, a fair amount of people within our audience who are already outreach uh, customers and so sure. they can start talking about like how they've solved their problem you know oh I've, I've experienced that same thing this is how we solved it or this is you know the process that you need to do to to you know they have great recommendations that are like field tested <laughs> I don't know if you have an answer for this question but it just sort of struck me how would outreach feel the impact of not of sales hacker going away like how for, as this as the ceo of outreach how would i how would i see that it doesn't exist i think it would be you know um i'm trying to think <laughs> as manny would he see the impact um you know, right now, I think we bring in a lot of people or bring brand awareness 
to people that aren't in market. Like, you know, our core our core mm-hmm. team, they're looking for people that are make looking to make a decision within what, six to you know, nine months, right? For right. a regular sales yep. cycle. They're looking for people that are in market. We might we might be talking to people that are, you know, SDRs now, and in two years they're going to be a, in an AE role using outreach, or maybe they're talking to we're talking to AEs that are going to be in a manager role, you know, somewhere down the line who needs to make that decision. And so I think it's like we're we're playing the long game. We're bringing brand awareness that our our core team probably isn't focused on right now. You know, we're we are, I would say grooming that next generation of outreach users and and decision makers well you don't have a there is no outreach try and buy model like you can't just log into the website and play with it right no Mm -mm. no so i mean this is your bottom-up sales model then you're engaging because the thing that i struggle with is is that we don't have anything like that right now there's nothing that you can play with on our on our website and we talk about the difference of being an enterprise player and so there's an enterprise sales cycle but people that work at enterprises are people Mm -hmm. that happen to also have a job and they want to go touch things and play with things and there needs to be that that bottom up engagement because they might not be a buyer but they're a potential user, they're an influencer, they're somebody that recognizes inside the business what's happening. And, and if we're not the one, they'll find something else. Mm-hmm. And that intelligence, like you said, might not be this year, it might be next year, or the year after that they get tasked with solving a problem. And we were never on their radar. And that's right. part of the reason that we, we do this. But in general, um, I think that's just a hard thing for B2B companies that don't have that PLG approach. How do you engage from the bottom up and that's i think that's a a great use of what you're doing is is to drive that early connection with somebody that doesn't know that they want to buy a product yet and it's it's funny because we've had outreach um i know that we've got outreach customers aes like direct users who says who, who will say i will not go to my next i will not accept an offer unless they have outreach like it's that powerful but unless you've been in it Like, I don't think you understand how much of a difference it makes in your day to day workflow. And even myself, like as now as I'm an outreach user, um, I'm like, wow, how would I ever not use this? (laughs) I don't how do I do this without, you know, this? Um, And it's last year I really wanted to focus on with the content is like stirring up the emotions around these pain points that you have, like these challenges, day-to-day challenges every day as an AE or an SDR to the point where it's like, this is no longer comfortable to live with this kind of pain. I need to find a solution. And now I've, I've like been invited to attend this webinar and there's an outreach person on there. And now I have, you know, visibility into this brand and understand how this solves that problem. You know, it's like you want to, I want to make sure we talk about it to the point where it's like, I can't stand it anymore. I'm just, there's so much discomfort. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't live with this pain anymore. (laughs) The best way to do it. So I like to end these episodes with something called the PSOTD. That's the provocative statement of the day. Something that is a closely held opinion that you have, or maybe you don't even have, but you just think people might not agree with, or maybe they will. Um, What would your provocative statement of the day be? I would probably say burn your personas, <laughs> which I mean, Ooh. I know, like we're taught as marketers Go like, on. We have to develop these personas with in-depth, like, you know, what do they watch? Where do they watch it? What, you know, how do they, how many kids do they have? Yeah, I mean, I've had personas at every company that I have, but, you know, I feel like don't burn your personas like don't even concentrate on like all those nuances until you understand like this core problem like get so ingrained in that core problem like I just need to do this one thing this job and then you can bring in like here are all the nuances so that you can segment appropriately so you can get to like the right channels or use the right language but like don't get too into the weeds of a persona until you understand like that core problem and for me it's like save me money make me money keep me safe <laughs> You know, so and like, what I'm hearing is it doesn't matter. I don't need to know that I'm 
pitching to a male age 45 to 54 if I don't have something that solves a problem for somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Solve your problem first. (laughs) Solve a problem, you know, find a problem first. Like most companies, they find a problem and that a large a large surface area under that bell curve they need to solve, right? Like, what is that problem? Understand that problem to the point where it's like, I know what impact it's gonna have, the people that it'll impact, like that first. And then the person who has to solve that problem, how does it affect them? You know, that's the persona. But I like to really get ingrained. That's why I kind of like talk to the developers and talk to professional services and customer service. Like, what are they experiencing? Like, how are people experiencing this problem in, in different aspects? Um, but yeah, like I just try not to get too deep in the weeds until I understand that core problem. I love that. Marcella, thank you so much for being on the show. This was great. You were great. Um, thank you. Thanks thank very you much for coming. Me. Absolutely. Excellent. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Word Birds. Word Birds is hosted by Chris Willis, produced by Charlotte Baxter Reed, and brought to you by AfroLinks. For more information on AfroLinks, visit www.acrolinks.com.